have been following the momentous changes that the United States experienced after the Civil War and Reconstruction under the twin forces of geographic expansion in the West and economic expansion with the rise of industrial capitalism. When we focus on the economic and social changes wrought by industrialization, we often call this period the Gilded Age. A term coined by Mark Twain in 1873 to capture the sense of living in a time in which the fantastic and shiny exterior of society coated and masked a rotten underbelly of greed and corruption. Now, as we've seen, the Industrial Revolution wrought, brought with it rapid and bewildering transformation in every aspect of American life, economic, political, social, cultural, and so on. On the one hand, the productive energies released by the proliferation of machine technology revolutionized the way we live, generated cities, jobs, and an ever-increasing array of new goods, services, and conveniences that lifted the American standard of living. On the other hand, the process of industrialization was so rapid and so uncontrolled and destabilizing that one consequence was a quick-growing list of challenges and hard problems throughout all of American society. And so we begin to see very early in the Gilded Age a groundswell of activity across the United States demanding that these new ills of modern life be addressed and fixed. Ultimately this impulse for reform will coalesce into a broad activism called progressivism and historians will eventually identify the period from roughly 1890 up into perhaps 1920 as the progressive era, a critical period in the development of modern America. But we're not there yet. To get us there, I want you to see that this reform impulse predated progressivism and that it had significant roots in the 1870s in the populist movement. In fact, some historians, particularly the late great Richard Hofstadter, argued that we should think of a very large period of U.S. history beginning with the populism of the 1870s and including the progressive era and well beyond, maybe as far as the New Deal, during which Americans were actively working to reform all levels of society. He called this era the Age of Reform. Now, without question, Americans in the late 19th century began to call for reform in vast and impressive numbers throughout the whole period, until it became a political tradition a way that Americans conduct politics. And what were Americans calling uh, to reform in this period? Well, what weren't they seeking to reform? Here's just a handful of examples of the amazing flurry of reform activism in this period of time. You have the big movements, populism and progressivism. There's the labor movement, the women's suffrage movement, temperance movement, the settlement house project, movements to eliminate and alleviate poverty, the free silver movement, movements for immigration reform, anti-lynching act activism, civil rights activism, a movement for the regulation of big business, consumer protection causes, and of course at the extreme end of the spectrum, socialism and anarchism. This tornado of activity and activism demands historical analysis. Look at it. So much activity going on. And what are the most significant historical questions? Why? Why did so many Americans begin agitating for reform in this period in time? How? How did they go about working towards their goals? And of course, so what? That is, what came about from this? How did the reform movements of the 19th and 20th centuries change the United States? Now let's go back to the title of this presentation, Movements of the People. What do we mean when we talk about the people? These are the first lines of the Constitution, we the people. Who are the people? Now there's a strong, very old strand of American politics that appeals to these questions directly called populism. And so what is populism? Well, for our purposes, we should talk about populism in two ways, one with a capital P and one with a lowercase p. In these terms, big P populism refers to a specific, historically bound phenomenon, the populist or people's party, a third party 
that rose out of the Plains states in the South in the 1890s became a serious challenge to the Republicans and Democrats and then vanished from the political scene just about as fast as it, as it had risen. The other small p form of populism is a much larger and infinitely more slippery phenomenon. Small p populism refers to a form or style of politics where one sides with the people against the elites. The elites are usually identified as the establishment, entrenched interests who usually enforce the status quo. From the populist perspective, their control of the reins of power, economic and political, is clear corruption and a subversion of the democratic rule of the people, and hence a violation of the spirit, if not the letter, of the Constitution. As a style of political speech, this is a very old strand of American culture. And all throughout history, populism has swelled and ebbed at all various times across the centuries. Um, and... Populism is a style used by politicians from all sides of the political spectrum, left and right. It doesn't refer to a particular ideology. It's a style of rhetoric and political speech. Um, for example, think about the current climate where we're living today. We're kind of living in a political era right now uh, in which populism has become something of a, of a tsunami. Um, for example, think about the rhetoric and political speech today, the constant appeal of political outsiders with phrases like, I'm not a Washington insider, I'm running against the establishment. And as you can see from these pictures here, that includes everything from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump. Consider also the, and this, and these political outsiders are always in opposition to sort of what is considered to be the establishment or entrenched political interests. Consider the current Tea Party movement that arose over the past decade. This is, in many ways, a populist movement. Or at least, it was a populist movement. It's a movement with a populist message. However, as we'll see, populism is a powerful force that politicians love to harness the energy of once out of the grassroots movement. It's a tale as old as politics. To give you an example of populism in American history, here's a question for you. Which of these presidents ran with a small p populist message? Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan. You could pause it and th video and think about it for a second. And then click on it again. Okay, you're back. <laughs> This is a trick question. It's all of the above. Andrew Jackson appealed directly to the people in opposition to the Bank of the United States. Abraham Lincoln advocated a populist free labor ideology against the aristocratic slave owners of the South. And Ronald Reagan represented himself as the voice of the real people, what Richard Nixon had called the silent majority, against the smaller, in his mind, group of limousine liberals. Indeed, it is really rare that any modern politician doesn't try to carry a populist message. So to begin our sort of historical analysis here, let's return to where we are in the past and start looking for the origins of what became big P populism in the 1890s. And again, this refers to the populist party, also known as the People's Party. This was an entirely new political party that was founded in 1891 and rocketed to national prominence, ran candidates for president in the elections of 1892, 1896, and then pretty much disintegrated and vanished just as quickly as it had risen. We're going to trace populism from its origins as a grassroots agrarian revolt through its expansion in the reform-minded America of the late Gilded Age to its rise and fall as an organized political party. Scholars debate the meaning and the impact of populism, but no one debates the fact that the populist movement began as, and was always largely, an agrarian movement. It was centered on the states and territories of the Great Plains and the South. These areas suffered tremendous economic turmoil under the twin pressures of crop price decline and the transformation of the U.S. economy. After the Civil War, these regions suffered a number of agricultural crises. As you'll recall, railroad expansion was fostered by Congress granting cash loans and grants of public land to subsidize construction. 
some 129 million acres of public land was transferred from the federal government to privately owned railroads. Railroads encouraged new settlement to the land surrounding the roads for agriculture, despite much of the land being deemed work worthless. Encouraged by railroad advertising and following the pack panic of 1873, settlers began pouring into these areas, and populations exploded. Kansas grew from 365,000 to nearly a million in the 1870s. Nebraska's population tripled, and from the 1870s to the 1880s, there was a speculative boom, which kept prices for farmland artificially high. Booms typically followed by bust. For farmers in Kansas and Nebraska, the Dakotas, and eastern Colorado, unusually heavy rains in the early 1880s gave way to a period of protracted drought in 1887. Crops failed. Land prices dropped. Eastern capital withdrew. Banks collapsed and dried up. Hard times hit the plains. The southern plantation economy had been destroyed by the Civil War. Great landed estates, previously fueled by Confederate bonds and slavery, were broken up or became abandoned. The sharecropping system emerged in theory to serve needs of owners and poor farmers alike. But in practice, this crop lean system, in which future crops would be mortgaged, mortgaged to merchants and landowners in exchange for credit on current purchases, trapped blacks and poor whites in a web of debt and perpetual servitude. Crop lean also encouraged a cotton monoculture, as merchants basically demanded that sharecroppers plant cotton. This left little room for sustenance farming, deepening the debt of poor farmers. Thus, hard times and discontent. So, these are the agricultural regions of the country suffering tremendously uh, in the 17, 1870s and 1880s. So, what was the problem? Well, the basic fact was the continual decline in the price of farm goods. Farmers, in fact, often had too much crop. It was often cheaper to burn it um, because they couldn't uh, get prices, good prices on the market. So why did the price of farm goods fall? Well, the settled West brought more farmland into production, increasing agricultural output, causing prices to drop. Prices in the 1880s for farm products fell some, sometimes 50%, much faster than the price of manufactured goods were declining due to the big business production. Farmers had to try to expand production to make more money, and banks charged higher interest rates. Railroad rates are four times higher than eastern manufacturers in the plains. In isolated areas, railroad rates were even higher. So agricultural goods are making less money, and it's costing more money to get them out to the, uh, into the market. So what could be done to arrest this problem? Well, faced with these mounting problems, farmers began to organize in alliances for collective security, seeing themselves as being more having more strength in numbers. So an early response to the blight of the farmer was the Grange movement. The Grange, or the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry, was the first agricultural advocacy group in the United States, founded in 1867 to promote the economic and political interests of the agricultural community on a national scale. Next came the Farmers Alliance, which began, which began in the South, as the first of a series of regional farm organizations, and then the Southern Alliance in Texas in 1875, organized originally to apprehend horse thieves, uh, round up stray animals, and cooperatively purchase large stores of supplies. This idea of cooperative uh, purchasing of supplies, or cooperatives, was the idea was to collectively bulk up on goods like cotton, and sell it cooperatively, hence controlling the price. This is kind of farmers taking a little bit of a page from J.D. Rockefeller's book. In 1877, the Northern or National Farms, Farmers Alliance was formed by a group of Grangers. They, advocate, they advanced many of the Grange, Grange's goals, unfair practices of railroads, for example. They wanted railroad regulation. They also wanted to reform the tax system on a local level and they supported Grange-sponsored insurance companies. Later on, the Colored Alliance was formed in 1887 in Texas after the Southern Alliance made it clear that black farmers were banned from their group. They did make some achievements. Uh, they 
cooperative stores bought, brought, bought directly from wholesalers and sold to farmers at a lower rate, sometimes 20 to 30 percent below. However, they were always fragile and faced hostility from wholesalers who had the power to drive them out of business. State-to-state so -state laws were enacted, but none of this alleviated the problem. Behind all of this was also a profound sense of dislocation at the erosion of the agricultural ideal and a feeling of helplessness under the industrial transformation brought about by the rise of industrial capitalism. Back in the age of Jefferson, farmers were glorified as the backbone of the nation. But now, in the age of cities and industrialism, farmers came to be seen as rednecks, as hayseeds, and idiots, buckwheats. So over the 1880s, the limited effects of the local policies of the alliance did little to address the overall problems of deflation and depressed agricultural prices. Thus, there was a move to establish a third party on the national stage. The People's Party, or Populist Party, was officially founded in 1891 as an amalgamation of various populist movements of the time and the belief that the two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, were controlled by bankers, landowners, and elites that were hostile to the needs of the small farmers and the working class. From 1889 to 1892, several reform conferences cemented the Union. Then, on July 4, 1892, the party had its formative convention in Omaha, Nebraska, and nominated candidates for president and announced its platform. The Omaha platform, as it came to be called, was announced on, the, on Independence Day in 1892 and laid out the whole position of the People's Party in opposition to the uh, two uh, established parties, entrenched established parties. You know, they called for the abolition of national banks, echoing something, a sentiment that went back to Andrew Jackson's populist um, rhetoric. They called for a graduated income tax. That is, those people in the country making more money should pay more taxes. They called for direct election of U.S. Senators. Up until this point, U.S. Senators were not directly elected by the people. And hence, for the populace, this was seen to be a derangement of democracy. They called for limits to presidential terms which did not exist, so a president could theoretically run for president again and again and again. They called for the eight-hour workday, and this, this part of their platform reflects the fact that the farmers have now, at this point, by 1892, made contacts and alliances with the working uh, parties, with the working people's parties, the labor movement. Uh, this eight-hour workday is particular um, priority of the labor movement. They also called for federal control of key industries, so, to, so industries like railroads, to take them out of the hands of private interests and money making and put them under federal control or the control of the people. And they called for free silver, that is the monetization of, free, of silver to expand the, uh, the monetary base of currency in the United States from uh, gold to include silver. And keep your eye on this one because we're coming back to it. Uh, this was really remarkable. By 1892, they fielded a presidential candidate. And as you can see from this map here, he won several states, um, getting 5% of the electoral vote uh, but not and 9% of the popular vote, vote. And that's a very good outcome for a party that was just formed. Uh, there, as you can see in the map, they were especially strong in the strongholds of the populist movement in the plain states and in uh, parts of the south. Populists gained can, uh, political credibility and recognition as being a viable political party with influence on the national stage. During their move towards consolidation in 1889, the leaders of the Southern Farmers Alliance and the Agricultural Wheel Organizations contacted Terence V. Powderly, leader of the Knights of Labor. In fact, as your book states, this contact between leaders of the farmers movement and the labor movement 
help pave the way for a series of reform conferences held between December 1889 and 1892 that resulted in the formation of the National People's Party. So what we're seeing here is the expansion of the concept of populism to include more and more people. Once you're using the rhetoric of the people, it's hard to limit it to just farmers. So now farmers and workers, the working class, are starting to see parts of their interests that are aligned, all against the entrenched interests of the establishment. Um, as your textbook shows, the battle, battles that had been being waged between workers and management and businesses was so fierce in this period uh, that it has come to be termed the labor wars. And that's no exaggeration. We're talking about war. Um, we have been reading about in the textbook the beginnings of the labor movement and the establishment of national unions like the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. These are national organizations aiming for collective security, uh, collective um, bargaining power, um, uh, uniting um, with more, more and more workers in order to um, amass power. And what were the objectives of the labor movement? Well, they sought to sort of mitigate the effects of mechanization of labor. So that was a big problem for um, laborers is that the more mechanization that came into the factory, the more human um, muscle power was displaced. They were also advocating for lower, for uh, uh, against low wages. So they're sort of battling mechanization, they're battling low wages. They were battling long hours. They wanted better hours, including uh, an eight hour work day. The labor movement were looking to improve working conditions. Some conditions in some factories was at, were absolutely deplorable. Uh, they were striking out against the loss of control over their labor. So you have to think about the way that we're going from industrialization is bringing us from a previous time in which labor is considered to be a source of pride and personal honor and ownership to a loss of control as people are becoming de-skilled and seen as just dispensable um, um, workers in the, in the economy. Uh, that is related to the dignity of work. So the labor movement is aiming to reinvigorate the concept of dignity of your own personal ownership of your work. Um, there are three sort of major conflicts that illustrate this fight over greater work control over industrialization and the sanctity of private property. And we'll get to those in a second. Right here, I just want to show you the labor, the map of the labor strike of 1877. This is a major moment in the history of American labor, showing the the, the expansion in the beginning of uh, the national union movement. And you can see here that labor strikes from 1870 to 1880 are proliferating all over the country. So this is a national movement. Uh, and it's right on the forefront of the beginning of the Gilded Age and industrialization. So it happens really fast. A uh, quintessential example of what's happening here in the labor wars is the Homestead Strike of 1892. So this is the Homestead Steel Plant in Pittsburgh, 1892. This strike is in many ways a kind of template and a measure of the problems of the confrontation between labor and corporate ownership. In 1883, Carnegie Steel bought the two-year-old Homestead Steel Plant in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. By this point, as you can see from looking at this image, this the Homestead, Pennsylvania was dominated by the steel plant. And the whole town could be called a steel town. Pretty much everybody that lived in this town worked at the, at the plant. And by that point, the plant was operated by one of the strongest unions in the whole United States, the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, or the AA through strikes, through constant negotiations, they had managed to gain rights to wage scales, working hours, workload levels and speeds, and working conditions. The AA was a union of skilled workers holding the line against the de-skilling and mechanization of work in the United States. And it was this union and these group of workers that Carnegie inherited when he bought the plant. Now Andrew Carnegie initially acknowledged the power of the AA. And membership actually doubled under it once he took over the ownership of the uh, of the steel plant. But conflict was pretty much inevitable. Publicly, Andrew Carnegie spoke in favor of unions, 
but privately he had already decided he was going to break the AA and he turned to his hard-nosed industrialist partner Henry Clay Frick to kick, take care of the situation to be the front piece for the assault on the uh, labor or, uh, on the union in February 1892 Frick entered into negotiations with the AA he countered their demands for a wage increase with a 22 percent wage decrease he announced that if no contract was signed by May agreeing to the 22 percent wage decrease Carnegie Steel would cease to recognize the Union when no agreement was reached Carnegie uh, Frick locked the workers out of the mill erected a fence topped with barbed wire and sniper towers with searchlights as well as a high-pressure water cannons so this is the lockout that started on June 30th 1892 so when the Union uh, refused to uh, accept a 22 wage uh, percent wage decrease the workers were locked out of the plant and the, the plant was essentially fortified in a mass meeting on June 30th, the local AA concluded that the company had violated the terms of their labor contract by locking them out one day before it expired. The Knights of Labor joined in a sympathy strike that began that the following day, followed by workers and plants in Pittsburgh, Duquesne, Union Mills, and Beaver Falls. So strikes sort of began here, and then sympathy strikes appeared in other parts of the country. The workers were determined to keep the mill closed and not let other workers that were, would be hired outside of the Union to go in and do work for Carnegie. They patrolled the, the rivers and mill along military lines, challenging strangers to explain who they were before they could be, would be let go. They were a tight, well-organized labor affair and the first of its kind. So. Henry Frick was in no way about to give up. He was in it for the long haul. So he hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And when I say detective agency, you might get a false sense of what this really was. This was actually uh, like a militia that hired itself out in the service of corporations. So it was a private army that could be hired out by corporations to deal specifically with problems like strikers uh, and to um, they were hired to open up the mill and get non-union workers in. 300 Pinkertons crept up the river in a barge under the cover of night on July 5th, armed with Winchester rifles. The strikers were waiting for them, including women and entire families. What followed was literally a battle. So when we talk about the labor wars, we're talking about actual battles. Uh, after a 10-minute firefight, two strikers were killed and 11 were wounded, two Pinkertons were killed and 12 wounded, and then the battle continued throughout the day. Strikers tore up uh, steel beams to build barricades to keep up the fight. Uh, Pinkertons slunk away on a tugboat, attempting to fight from the river, and then the battle was observed and joined by 5,000 people from the town who set up a 20-pound brass cannon to sink the bar Pinkerton barges in the, in the water. More than 300 riflemen positioned themselves on high ground to keep up the assault. The strikers soaked a raft in oil and set it on fire and launched it into the barges. Some Pinkertons panicked but were threatened by their own captain with death if they tried to run. Later in the afternoon, the Pinkertons surrendered and they were marched through the town to the Opera House, being continually assaulted along the way. This was the moment of victory for the uh, Union. The strikers then sent word to a panicked Governor Patterson of Pennsylvania that law and order had been restored, but he was unconvinced. Initially overwhelmed by the populism of the strike, the governor now felt the need to respond, especially since he had been elected governor with the backing of Carnegie. The Pennsylvania state militia was sent in. The militia quickly dispersed the strikers and brought in strike breakers, and then things dragged on. The mill was losing money and could not afford temporary workers, and furthermore, on July 8th, the town was placed under martial law. Then, on July 23rd, Alexander Berkman, a New York anarchist with no connection to steel or organized labor, plotted with his love Emma Goldman to assassinate Henry Frick. He shot and stabbed him in his office. Henry Frick survived, and the assassination attempt completely undermined public support, prompting the collapse of the strike. 
Ultimately, the AA was forced to return to work on Carnegie's terms. The Homestead Strike was a devastating defeat for the labor movement and is seen by many historians as the end of a distinct streak of labor activism and a particular form of labor democracy in America. So we're talking about here the labor wars and the homestead strike being a really good representation of, of that whole concept of labor wars and this initial collision between labor and management. Uh, two other examples are sort of useful in thinking about how things could play out in these conflicts. There's the Cripple Creek miner strike in 1894 in Colorado. The issue here was over mine owners attempting to extend the workday of the miners to 10 hours, from 8 to 10 hours. The Western Federation of Miners linked arms to insist on the 8-hour workday, and they rallied uh, support. The key here was that the governor of Colorado at that time, Davis White, was a populist who had been elected in 1894. As such, he refused to use the state militia the way that, fri that the way that the governor of Pennsylvania had in the Homestead strike to break the strike, and he was able to negotiate with the workers to put down their arms and arbitrate as long as he was the arbitrator. So here we see the state ultimately playing a very uh, important role in the way these strikes turn out one way or the other. More typical than this sort of uh, uh, resolution of this conflict was the Pullman strike in 1894. This one pitted the American Railway Union or the ARU against the government of the United States, or I'm sorry, against the Pullman Company uh, that made uh, railroad car, uh, rail, uh, train cars, the main railroads, and then eventually brought the Union into conflict with the U.S. government under Grover Cleveland. Factory workers who built Pullman cars lived in a, co a company town of Pullman on the south side of Chicago, a town designed by George Pullman as a model workers community and controlled by the company. Laying off workers without reducing rents resulted in a strike. So basically the company owns the building owns the, and owns the houses that the people live in. People were laid off and rents for their uh, apartment owned by the company were not lowered. So this led to a strike of the ARU led by Eugene B. Debs. Debs called for a massive boycott against all trains carrying Pullman cars, which affected most rail lines west of Detroit and some 250,000 workers at its peak in 27 different states. Some railroad unions opposed the strike, but it was also, but it was remarkably successful. It was essentially peaceful. There were incidents, uh, but nothing to the extent of the Great Railroad Strike or the Homestead Strike. The situation nevertheless was ratcheted upward. As, as the textbook indicates, Attorney General Richard B. Olney, tied to the railroads, was determined to break the strike. When the Illinois governor, Illinois governor refused to call troops, President of the United States Grover Cleveland was persuaded to send in federal troops, and an injunction was issued to prevent Eugene V. Debs from ever speaking in public. Debs was then arrested, and the strike eventually beheaded, and he was sent to jail. And incidentally, while he was in jail, he read Karl Marx, and by the time he emerges from jail, he'll be a committed, lifelong socialist. So the labor, these events were part of the groundswell of small p populism. Um, and labor populists endorsed public ownership of railways and expansion of government power for reasons similar to farmers, but added the eight-hour workday uh, and outlawing of Pinkertons. Now in the fall of 1893, the economy fell into a deep depression, or what they used to call panics. There were uh, people were afraid they were losing all their money in the bank, so there were runs on the bank where people go to the bank to give in their bank notes and get gold in uh, in response, uh, in return. Um, the next spring, on the West Coast, unemployed workers banded together to travel to Washington to protest their conditions. They made common cause with the Ohio populist Jacob Coxey, who led a petition in boots, that is a march of the unemployed, to Washington, D.C., seeking a federal program to improve roads and stimulate the economy through dollar inflation. Coxey's army arrived in Washington, D.C. on May 1st, and police immediately set upon them and started cracking heads. Jacob Coxey was sent was jailed and fined five dollars for walking on the grass. So-called war correspondents, journalists, covered this increasingly militant populist revolt and the establishment clearly responded. 
what they were calling Coxey's Army of the Unemployed and Poor, along with the strike wave followed by the shutdown of much of the nation's railways and the Pullman strike, underscored the deep discontent among American workers in the Gilded Age. But for many Americans, the populist connection to these developments made populism itself seem especially frightening. Another participant at the Populist Convention in Omaha in 1892 was Francis Willard, head of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU. She learned how to ride a bicycle at the age of 53, and in the 1880s and 1890s, a woman riding a bicycle was a sign that she was a free-thinking radical. Women joined the populist movement in huge numbers. By 1890, 250,000 women had enrolled in the Farmers Alliance, and many other women would later support the People's Party. The novelist Hamlin Garland observed at the time that, quote, no other movement in history had appealed to women as much as populism did. Now, why did women choose to join the populist movement? Uh, one partial answer is for the same exact reasons as men. They shared in the work and worries of the farm, and they sought the same reforms to alleviate rural poverty. As a woman lecturer for the Kansas Farmers Alliance puts it, all things that are of interest to men are of like interest to women. But populism was a broad challenge to the status quo, to the establishment, so it also provided means for women to take steps towards independence, to define and claim their rights as citizens of the United States. Despite their deliberately segregated positions in a male-dominated society, especially through disenfranchisement, women have acted upon the whole of society, including politics, all along. This is despite the fact of the sort of cultural and social construct of separate spheres in which men dominate the public sphere of work and business and women are supposed to control the home and stay out of politics. And yet despite this, the separate spheres was breaking down and women were entering into the political sphere. One way that this was happening was through women's clubs, which were proliferating in the years following the Civil War, that is, between the 1860s and 1890s, often in direct response to exclusion from political participation. At first, these clubs were largely literary clubs, uh, intellectual clubs for women to get together and uh, discuss literature. Uh, pulled, but they were pulled together by Jane Crawley and became the General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1890. That is a national movement. And you should, as time went on, they devoted more attention away from literature to civic usefulness, endorsing an end to child labor, the eight-hour workday, drug and food legislation, all issues that pertained especially to uh, the family and home life. And you should be picking up a theme here of organizations that begin at the grassroots on the local level, work locally and then through state level, and then eventually become national organizations. The women's activist movements are uh, um, no exception to that. At the same time, women's activism inc included the campaign against lynching. If you remember Ida B. Wells, was um, a southern woman who um, uh, wrote a book analyzing and deconstructing and criticizing the, the wave of lynching taking place in Jim Crow South. Women's suffrage uh, will become eventually come to the forefront, and we'll talk about that in a second. That is the, the campaign for the right to vote. But at this time, the temperance movement was the largest group of organized women for much of the late 19th century. Uh, this was, in fact, an old, religiously motivated movement dating back to the 1820s, led at first by Protestant men. Temperance did not mean prohibition. So when we talk about temperance, we're not talking about the outlawing of alcohol. Instead, we're talking about voluntary abstinence, a movement to get people to voluntarily stop drinking. It became popular among women precisely because of the separate spheres concept, because it was alcohol was having a detrimental effect on the home. Uh, so alcohol was an attack on the home. In the 1860s and 1870s, there was one saloon for every 50 males over 15. In this period, temperance became more radical, moving for complete abolition of alcohol. The Women's Crusade was a very public display, including marching and singing, and it spread rapidly across the Midwest and into the eastern cities, culminating in the foundation of the all-women Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1874, with Frances Perkins as its head, or Frances Willard as its head. <clears throat> 
Furthermore, alcoholism came to be seen as a result of poverty, drawing women into labor issues. So Francis Willard and others joined with the Knights of Labor to fight for better working conditions and prompted to form the, a broad coalition with the Knights of Labor, the People's Party, and the Prohibition Party. The crucial point here is that temperance provided a means for women to respectably enter the political field and begin asserting their abilities and rights even without the vote. It was for the strongest it was the strongest mass women's group, and it provided decades of experience for women in organizing, lobbying, drafting legislation, and running charity institutions. This will then funnel into the uh, women's suffrage movement. Now, compared to temperance, the fight for women's right to vote was a small and relatively weak in the late 19th century. This movement was founded by Elizabeth Cady Stanton way back in 1848 at the Seneca Falls, New York, and attracted a very small group of the century's premier radicals, abolitionists and such. In 1869, Stanton was joined with uh, joined with Susan B. Anthony to form the National Women's Suffrage Association, demanding the right to vote. Several other groups were formed to lobby on the local, state, and national levels. The, the women's activism was an important facet of the populist wave in the 19th century, demonstrating its reach well beyond the People's Party. Many women saw the populist movement as a way to win voting rights. At the state level, the Farmer Alliance and the Farmers Alliances and the Mid in, in the Midwest and West supported women's suffrage, and under populist state governments, women won, won the right to vote in Colorado in 1893 and in Idaho in 1896. But some populists, mainly in the South, objected to women entering politics, and the National People's Party refrained from endorsing a woman's suffrage plank. The People's Party, from Cincinnati and Chicago to Denver and San Francisco, gathered together farmers, trade unionists, champions of women's rights, urban coalitions of socialists, and a variety of nonconformists and free thinkers. As we saw, the People's Party had an encouraging start at the polls. In 1892, James Weaver of Ohio won over a million votes as populist candidate for president and 9% of the total. The populist blocks in California, North Carolina, and other states held the balance of power in legislatures. This was the most promising third-party movement since the rise of the Republican Party in the decade before the Civil War. But the populists remained far from gaining national power. In the northeastern states, powerful Republican and Democratic machines effectively froze out a populist challenge. The People's Party scored its major victories in Republican western states and Democratic southern states, where the populace emerged as the reform opposition. But even then, whether in North Carolina or Kansas, populist electoral victories were almost always the result of a so-called fusion of agreements with either the Democrats in the West or the Republicans in the South. The national movement came to focus on one key issue, monetary reform. Farmers were being clobbered by deflation, that is, a dropping price for their goods. One way to look at the problem of deflation is that there's not enough money in circulation. That is, there's too little actual currency, coins, and banknotes to buy things. Gold was the standard, and there was only so much gold to be minted into coins. The goal of monetary reform was to increase the money supply in order to get farm prices to rise. They sought to coin silver and get the United States off the gold standard. If the gold supply was stable, one could not increase the money supply. Yet, if also if you were also coining silver, which was more plentiful than gold, then you can increase the money supply. Prices go up. That's inflation. So the goal of the uh, people's movement, the populist movement, coalesced around the concept of deliberately creating inflation. So all those issues that we saw on the Omaha platform have all sort of fallen to the side as the populist movement has moved in on one single focus, what they call free silver. Um, and free silver is considered to be, by the by the leaders of the populist movement to be the key to successful uh, accomplishment of all their other goals. So as 1886 approached, the Depression 
exacerbated cries for reform, not only among populists, but throughout the country, but electorate. In this climate, the issue of monetary reform became the centerpiece of the debate, and in many ways crystallized, crystallizing, but also oversimplifying the problems, as politics is wont to do. Republicans nominated William McKinley, who had forged a coalition of businessmen, professionals, skilled factory workers, and shrewdly prosperous farmers. He also had strong support in the Northeast, the Upper Midwest, and the Pacific Coast. McKinley campaigned on a platform of preserving the gold standard. Western advocates of free silver walked out of the convention when he announced this. On the other hand, the Democratic Party was also splitting due to Grover Cleveland's endorsement of the gold standard. In 1896, William Jennings Bryan, a young congressman from Nebraska, captured the Democratic nomination for the presidency on the platform of silver inflation and other reforms that rural votes, voters wanted. So pay attention to what's happening here. The Democratic Party is dr drawing on this va huge populist wave, this grassroots rave, wave that's propelled the People's Party to the forefront, but he's from the Democratic Party, and he's hoping to siphon off all of that enthusiasm away from the third party people's uh, um, movement. Um, in the Democratic nominating convention, he gave an electrifying populist tinge speech to come to become known as the cross of gold speech where he yelled do not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold his nomination for the democratic party split the people's party as some populists wanted to fuse with the democratic ticket while middle of the road populists wanted an independent people's party ticket in the end he was endorsed by democrats the populist party and silver republicans so this is classic third party conundrum when a third party recognizes that it doesn't have enough movement enough uh, constituency to capture the national office, do you fuse with a bigger one of the major two parties? And that's what they did here. So fusion seemed to promise some victory. However, there are some problems. The vice president nominee, Arthur Sewell, was a railway road director and a banker placed on the ticket to appease conservative Democrats. There was also regional constituencies that were divided on taxes. Western populist champion Free Silver had no problem becoming Democrats once Bryan embraced the cause. So too in the Midwest. But the South was tough because of the history of the depth of rancor between the Democratic Party and the populists. In addition, even the limited alliance of black and white people in populist wave was anathema to many white Southerners. All these problems led to the collapse of the People's Party. But in some respects, the real deal was big business interests and money against the people. The South would eventually go Democrat. The Northeast stood with McKinley. It was the Midwest that held everything in the balance. So what happened? The election in many ways broke on that key issue of free silver. So farmers wanted inflation. They want prices to rise. So think about that. Their platform is to make things more expensive, that is, food. And they want to do this through this uh, free silver concept. Farmers wanted inflation, and the Republicans hammered at the Midwestern cities, not the agrarian areas, but the Midwestern cities, that the other side of the coin of, uh, infl of, of inflation is higher prices for people who are buying food. So higher prices for goods meant lower value of the dollar. So the erosion of the power of the dollar, as you can see here, free silver makes a dollar worth only 53 cents. That was their message, that inflation is going to make the dollar worthless. No matter how much farmers and laborers insist that they were united as producers against non-producing bosses, it was an unavoidable fact that inflation did not offer the boon to urban laborers that it did to Western farmers. And as a result, the Democrats lose this election to the Republicans. And the People's Party, which had already been splintered and fractured by this fusion with the Democratic Party, pretty much vanished from the face of the earth. So, just to conclude here, one last thing. I want to talk about um, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, the Wizard of Oz was a book that came out in 1900, written by Frank Baum. Now, Frank Baum here was a former populist newspaper editor who lived in South Dakota, where the populist movement was particularly strong. So, is The Wizard of Oz really just an a, a allegory for the populist movement and for this moment in populist history. Well, here's some of the evidence that people have suggested. First of all, Oz, O-Z, is the abbreviation for ounce, as in an ounce of gold or an ounce of silver. 
remember Dorothy. Let's think about the characters. Dorothy comes from Kansas, which was the single leading populous state in the whole entire Union. Dorothy's taken up by a tornado. And many in the 1890s compared pop, the populist wave to a political storm that swept across the nation. You think about the scarecrow. The scarecrow lacked a brain, which is the classic critique of farmers. Hayseeds, buckwheats, brainless uh, farmers. Dorothy, who represents the populace, will be able to lead him to his brain. That is, to the right political policy for, him, for, for farmers. The Tin Man represents everyday laborers who lack a heart because they've been dehumanized by industrialization, capitalism, and big business. Dorothy's going to help the everyday laborer find his humanism. What about the Cowardly Lion? Well, how about the Cowardly Lion represents William Jennings Bryan himself. People would say that William Jennings Bryan had a great roar, that he was a popular, he had a lot of good rhetoric and oratory, but really does he have the courage that he needs to succeed? William Jennings Bryan is a moving orator, but people were suspicious of him, believing that he wasn't a true populist, that he needed courage for success. Think about this. Dorothy lands in Oz, killing the wicked witch of the East, who represented the establishment of the industrialists and the bankers to the Midwest. The good witch of the North represents the populace. Also, Dorothy walks on a golden brick road, which leads to a wizard who's actually a flim-flam man and a fraud. The wizard lives in an emerald city, which could be Washington, D.C., where everyone sees things through the lens of green, the lens of gold. I mean, I'm sorry, of money. <laughs> now, what did Dorothy have to do in order to get back home? If you remember from watching the movie, she had to tap her ruby slippers together three times, and she could go back home. But here's the thing. In the original book... Dorothy's slippers weren't ruby, they were silver.